Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome everyone. Hope you're all keeping well and safe. And this is Tasneem Muhammad, a board member at Emirates Collaboration of Residents in Emergency Medicine, Ikram for short. Hey guys, thank you so much, Tasneem. This is Mesa. I'm also one of the members of ECRAM, Emirates Collaboration of Residents in Emergency Medicine. I hope you're all doing good and safe. Um, I'm really glad to be hosting my first session here to be one of the moderators in this session today. So after a successful first session, we are pleased to welcome you all to the second module under the uh, Evidence-Based Medicine Grand Round, the Research Work Plan. So the Research Work Plan is designed as a modular series of lectures that all together create a roadmap to conducting scientific research with a content tailored towards emergency medicine residents in the UAE, but it's generalizable to all national and international physicians, residents, medical students, and interns who are in, uh, interested in navigating a research from a concept to reality. Thank you, Tasneem. So as you may have all read, um, hopefully from our brochures that we've been circulating, um, this initiative is made uh, possible thanks to the collaboration with the team over uh, at BEAM, also known as uh, Best Evidence in Emergency Medicine. So to speak a little bit briefly about BEAM, BEAM is an international emergency medicine uh, knowledge translation program. It's actually created by the EM physicians and practitioners, and it has both the mission and vision of being the most valid, reliable, and unbiased uh, global source of current clinically relevant and patient-centered evidence for the EM physicians to be able to provide the best clinical evidence to optimize patient care. Um, we are also incredibly grateful and proud to be hosting some amazing physician uh, researchers, researchers from both um, the UAE and Canada. Um, we have put forth an invaluable effort to produce the content within this series today. Hey everyone, this is Nadal Saeed, a board member at Akram, and it's my pleasure to host the second EBM module. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please note that this session is being recorded and would be posted on the ECRM website. You will remain muted throughout the session to minimize the background noise. Kindly use the chat box if you have any questions. The moderators will be keeping track of your questions and pre presenting them to the speakers by the end of the module and the Q&A live session. Finally, if you experience any technical issues, contact me directly using the chat box. And I hope you have an informative and engaging session. Thank you, Nada. Um, without any further ado, let me introduce to you our first speaker of the day, um, Professor Andrew Worcester. He is a staff emergency physician and professor in the Division of Emergency Medicine and the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. He is also the founder and former director and editor-in-chief of the not-for-profit international knowledge translation project. Um, best Evidence in Emergency Medicine, also known as BEAM. Um, he is also an investigator for multiple clinical studies and his research on diagnostic tests in emergency medicine that is funded by the Canadian Institutes um, of Health Research. Uh, Professor Worcester is an advocate of evidence-based uh, emergency medicine and has published uh, multiple peer-reviewed uh, papers on this topic, as well as taught evidence-based medicine uh, to physicians around the world. Um, his favorite hobbies are uh, including scuba diving, skiing, and photography. Um, hi, Professor Andrew, if you can hear me. Hope you're doing good. Hello, hi. So now we're gonna start the first lecture, choosing the right study design. Hi everyone, and welcome to Choosing the Right Study Design. My name is Andrew Worcester. So the outline for this talk, we're going to cover the purpose of the research, the research for resources available, the different research study designs, the peacock question, and then we'll go over some examples. So, when you're trying to come up with a, a research project, 
you have to know what your research is intending to demonstrate. And we'll go into uh, more detail on that in a minute. The other thing is you have to consider what research, research resources do you have available? Because that's going to determine very much what you can and cannot do. So what is the research intending to demonstrate? If it's an epidemiological question, for example, in COVID-19 patients with chest pain, what is the incidence or prevalence of an NSTEMI? Another example, a diagnostic question. In COVID-19 patients with chest pain, can NSTEMI be detected with shorter interval serial troponins? about a prognostic question. In COVID-19 questions with chest pain, how well does an abnormal presentation troponin measurement predict 30-day mortality? A therapeutic question might be, in COVID-19 patients with dyspnea, does high flow nasal cannula oxygen reduce the need for endotracheal intubation? A harm question would be, in COVID-19 patients with chest pain, does smoking increase the rate of adverse outcomes? So, as I said, one has to consider what res uh, research resources they have available. Uh, do you have enough funding to perform 24-7 patient screening, 24-7 randomization, 24-7 enrollment, and 24-7 outcome assessments. Perhaps your study won't need that, but if you're thinking of a study that might need that, then obviously you're going to need those resources. In-kind support would include hospital administration support. That means that everybody in your department and in the hospital uh, is uh, in agreement and supports the study. Um, the staff, uh, if you're running it in the emergency department, that the uh, nursing staff and ancillary staff are all supportive. Do you have the office space for you and your staff? Uh, do you have additional patient space in case you need to keep patients for observation? And what additional patient resources are going to be needed. Do you plan on doing any continued observation, continued diagnostic testing or resources? Expertise. Uh, do you have an expert who can design the study? Uh, do you have an expert in clinical trial operations, an expert in data collection and storage uh, or statistical analyses? and even in scientific writing. These are all things to consider. So what are the research design options? Well, do you want a really strong study design? Do you want something, a study that you can complete quickly? So a fast study. And do you want uh, do you want to conduct a study that's affordable? Well, here's the problem. You can only have two of those at most. You're never going to get a study that is strong in the design and that's fast and cheap. So retrospective uh, observational studies. These are typically fast, so relatively quick to perform. Um, they are affordable. Sometimes it's just your own labor, but it's not a strong study design. Then there's uh, prospective observational studies. Potentially strong uh, if it's designed well, if you have the expertise. Uh, potentially cheap if you know how to conduct a study but it won't be fast because this takes time to follow patients along for outcomes. 
Then there's prospective experimental. Again, potentially very strong, not at all cheap because it takes a lot of expertise to conduct, the, uh, conduct these studies and not at all fast. So I've listed here some, uh, a table of observational studies, which uh, we're going to cover. So we'll start off with case study, and we'll go to case series, case control, cohort, uh, cross-sectional and ecologic. And at the end, we'll talk about, uh, we'll summarize uh, the direction, demonstration and measure of association of each. So let's start off with observation studies. Observational studies are, as the name implies, studies in which patients are observed over a period of time. The independent variable is the exposure, but we don't know if it's the cause of the outcome. Observational studies cannot prove cause. They can only show an association. The independent variable refers to a variable or exposure that is believed to cause influence or at least be associated with the outcome. The dependent variable therefore refers to an outcome that is believed to be associated with the independent variable. Again, observational studies cannot prove cause, but they can measure the degree of association, typically via our risk ratio or odds ratio. So the simplest observational study is a case study. A case study is a report on a single patient with an outcome of interest. No control is involved. The case study is simply used to generate a hypothesis about harm or etiology. This is for clinician to scientist communication. It's a way for clinicians to say to scientists, hey, I think there's a connection here and you need to study this and give us an answer. In the early 1900s, lung cancer was rare. By 1940, there were many case, uh, case reports hypothesizing an association between smoking and lung cancer. A case series is simply a report on more than one patient with an outcome of interest. Again, no control is involved and it's used to generate a hypothesis about harm or etiology. In the late 1950s, pregnant women were prescribed an untested medication as either a sedative or for morning sickness. The medication was called thalidomide. Dr. William McBride, a gynecologist in Sydney, Australia, suspected that thalidomide was the cause of limb and bowel malformations in three children he had seen. And so he published a short letter, a case series, in the journal, The Lancet. In situations in which it takes a long time for exposure to an independent variable to have a, an impact on the dependent variable, we use study designs that look backward in time. An example would be smoking and lung cancer. One of the most common study designs for this is the case control study. Case control studies involve first selecting subjects with the dependent variable or outcome of interest, who we call cases. Next, we select subjects from a demographically similar cohort who don't have the independent variable of interest, who we call controls. Then we look back in time through interviews or medical records to determine which subjects in each group were exposed to the independent variable. In 1948, Austin Bradford, Hill, and Richard Dole conducted one of the first ever case control studies. They administered a questionnaire with 50 questions about exposure, including tar on London roads and smoking, to 709 patients with lung cancer in 20 London hospitals. They also administered to 709 demographically similar patients on the same wards, but without lung cancer, of course, these were the controls. 
The results showed a very strong association between smoking and lung cancer. However, it didn't prove that smoking caused lung cancer. One often hears, oh, sorry. Case control studies are typically used to determine harm or etiology, especially when the outcome is rare or there's a long period between exposure and outcome. The downside is that there's a high risk of selection bias with respect to subjects selected to participate in the study and also in recall bias. That's the subject's recollection of exposure. The measure of association used for these studies is the odds ratio because it's retrospective. And I can't say this enough times, observational studies cannot prove cause. They can only show an association. One often hears the term cohort in health research and it can appear to have several meanings. The original term refers to a group of several Roman soldiers. In fact, 10 uh, cohorts equals one legion. But commonly, when we refer to a cohort in research, we, we're referring to one or more groups of people who share some characteristic. The characteristic could be a demographic such as age, sex, occupation, or even geographic region. Often, however, cohorts in health research studies have shared an event such as exposure or even rare disease. Regardless, a cohort is a group of people who have something in common. In health research, a cohort often refers to a group of people who were born around the same time. Specifically, this is a birth or generational cohort. So baby boomers are those who were born after the Second World War. Generation X is the next category. Then we've got Generation Y, or the other term for them is millennials. These are the tech savvy people. Another cohort is anti-vaxxers, not a generational cohort, but certainly a current cohort. So those are people without vaccination. And then we've got COVID-19. Uh, so that's a patient suffering COVID-19, uh, which is a cohort uh, in itself. At the time that I wrote this, these were mostly anti-vaxxers, but that's no longer the case. The Framingham Heart Study is based on a group of people all living in Framingham, Massachusetts in the United States. So this is a geographic cohort. The simplest observational design, uh, study design over time is the cohort study. Cohort studies involve first selecting a cohort uh, of subjects and then following them over time and recording the dependent variable or outcome of each cohort member. The timing of these studies can vary. If we select a current cohort and then follow them forward in time, we call it a prospective cohort observational so, uh, study. So just think of a uh, marching cohort of Roman soldiers moving forward. The British doctor's study by Austin Bradford-Hill and Richard Dahl was a prospective cohort study which followed more than 47,000 
male physicians in England uh, who were greater than 35 years old, smokers and non-smokers, and they followed them for 20 years. They found that the association between smoking more than 25 cigarettes a day and lung cancer was high with a relative risk greater than 50. A cohort study cannot prove cause because it's an observational studies. Again, only experimental studies such as a randomized control trial can, call, uh, can demonstrate cause. So, in summary, cohort studies are used to gather evidence of harm, etiology, prognosis, and therapy. It's a good design for common diseases, especially when the period between the exposure and the outcome is relatively short. And because it's prospective, we're following them in time, there's no recall bias involved as there is in case control studies. Uh, however, one can also conduct a cohort study retrospectively. That is, select your population back in time and follow them forward to see what happens to them. On the downside, cohort studies can be expensive because of the increased duration of the study and the longer the follow-up, the greater the number of subjects who drop out or are just lost along the way. Again, cannot prove cause with this. Perhaps the simplest planned uh, observational study is the cross-sectional study, which is often conducted as a survey. The cross-sectional study involves the observation of a defined population at a single point in time or time interval, such that the independent variable or exposure and dependent variable or outcome are determined simultaneously. A survey is an example of a cross-sectional study to determine prevalence. Cross-sectional studies are relatively easy and inexpensive to do. And as I just stated, can yield the prevalence of a particular exposure or outcome. On the downside, again, they cannot be used to determine causation and they're susceptible to multiple biases. An ecologic study is similar to a cross-sectional study, but uses population data rather than individual data and will give us an aggregate number of exposures and an aggregate number of outcomes. But we have no idea what proportion of the exposed have the outcome. For example, one might hear that five new McDonald's restaurants opened in Dubai and food poisonings in Dubai increased by 20%. Here we have an ecologic fallacy. Just because two or more phenomena occur in a single population during a similar time interval, it doesn't mean that they're associated. The example that five new McDonald's restaurants opened in Dubai and food poisoning cases in Dubai increased by 20% doesn't mean that the food poisonings occurred in people who ate at McDonald's, although it might suggest a connection. The assumption is that the increased prevalence of food poisonings is due to the increased number of McDonald's is what we call an ecologic fallacy. So here's the table uh, that I said we'd get back to and recap. So we started with the simple case study. So this is a retrospective study. All it can demonstrate is a hypothesis and there's no statistics involved. Uh, there's no measure of association whatsoever. It's just simply uh, reporting that something happened to a particular patient 
and we're just hypothesizing. Could it be related to the exposure? The case series is very similar. In fact, it's identical, except for the number of patients involved. Uh, remember the case of thalidomide with uh, Dr. William McBride. The case control is retrospective. That is, you start off with the end, with the disease, and then look backwards in time at the, uh, at the exposure. And you need a case, those with the disease, and a control, those who are similar but don't have the disease. The measure of the uh, association here is the odds ratio going back in time. Next is the cohort study, which is typically a prospective study. We follow patients along to see what happens to them once they're exposed. The measure of association here is the risk ratio. The cross-sectional study is a current study. We're just taking a snapshot in time of what's happening. So the example I used was the uh, survey. So again, we don't know that there's an association. All we can show is something called prevalence, the proportion of uh, patients who are affected. The ecologic study design is very similar, but we don't look at individual subjects. We look at the population as a whole and we take population data. So we have aggregate data on the percentage of the population with an outcome and say the percentage of the population that was exposed. And we don't necessarily know that the two are related. The assumption that the two are related is what we call ecologic fallacy. In health research, experimental studies are called clinical trials. These are typically controlled trials and can be randomized or non-randomized. Regardless, there are trials in which the independent variable is manipulated. We can use these to show benefit or harm, but they require a lot of time, a lot of expertise, and a lot of money. In health research experimental studies, Oh, sorry, once the study design and independent variables have been chosen, the research question writes itself. So these experimental studies are strong, but they're not fast and cheap. When writing the PCOT research question, we start off with P for population. I is for the intervention or exposure, control, uh, or comparator is the C. Outcome is uh, the O. And T is the time or duration uh, for the outcome to occur. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the main lecture. So let's go over some questions. So let's say we have uh, an epidemiological question. Uh, in COVID-19 patients with chest pain, what's the incidence prevalence of STEMI is the question we want to uh, answer. So how do we go about that? Well, we can use a cross-sectional study, which is probably the easiest. We could use a prospective cohort study which will take much longer, much more resources, uh, but likely be the most accurate. Or we could do a retrospective cohort study, uh, which would be easier than the prospective uh, and better than the cross-sectional, but might take more time. How about a diagnostic question? In COVID-19 patients with chest pain, can NSTEMI be detected with shorter interval serial troponins. What study design would we use for that?
Well, probably the best one is the clinical trial, an experimental study, because we want to show that if this new intervention, a shorter serial troponin interval, is better than the current uh, method of doing things. However, in diagnostic studies, very, very few people ever do clinical trials uh, for many reasons, but one of which uh, is they're expensive and a lot of expertise. Most commonly, we see prospective cohort studies being used for this uh, diagnostic studies. Occasionally, a retrospective cohort study, but um, these aren't nearly as good. For a prognostic question, here's one. In COVID-19 patients with chest pain, how well does an abnormal presentation troponin measurement predict 30-day mortality? So what design would you choose for that? Well, we could actually use a case control. We could select patients who had uh, 30 day adverse outcomes and look back in time and see what their, uh, their troponin measurements were. Ideally though, we probably want to do a prospective cohort. And again, retrospective cohort is another option, but not as good as the prospective cohort. For a therapeutic question, in COVID-19 pa patients with chest pain, does high flow nasal cannula oxygen reduce the need for endotracheal intubation? Well, again, ideally, one would want to answer this with a clinical trial, such as a randomized control trial. Uh, but again, a lot of time and expertise and money to, to do that. Another option is a prospective cohort. Uh, just follow patients along. Uh, you're going to have patients who are on high flow nasal cannula and others who aren't, and you can just follow them along to see the outcomes. Uh, similarly, could do a retrospective cohort, uh, but the results that you have won't be as valid uh, as with a prospective uh, or a clinical trial. Last of all, uh, a harm question. In COVID patients with chest pain, does smoking increase the rate of adverse outcomes? Well, you'd really want to do a, uh, a case control here. You'd want to look at COVID-19 patients who had uh, adverse outcomes and then look backwards and find out how many of them are smokers. You could do this with a retrospective cohort. You could do it with a prospective cohort. Uh, that would take much longer and be much more expensive. But any one of these would work. And again, it comes down to what is it that you're trying to demonstrate with your research, uh, research and what research resources do you have available? So. Thank you very much for your, your time, everyone. I hope you learned something from this. Thank you very much, Prof. Andrew. This is an enlightening direction on how to develop strong and focused research question that makes the backbone of a research study. And it was also enlightening on how to use the right study design accordingly. Now, the concept of any study is to provide an answer to a question, right? And without a clear question, you will probably end up with a paper that never really comes up together. So if a good research question is the lighthouse that guides your study, what is the starting engine and what is your roadmap that will help you sail through? Here now is Dr. Mansour Hussain. Uh, he uh, will provide us with a comprehensive guide on conducting a literature review and on writing a research protocol which provides a structure that keeps the flow of your study. Dr. Mansour is a graduate from the Imperial College School of Medicine in London 2005 with MBBS and a bachelor's degree in healthcare science and management. 
he did his postgraduate training in London. And um, after initially day blanket surgery, he completed his emergency medicine training in 2014. He worked for uh, five years as a consultant in emergency medicine at St. George Hospital, which is a large trauma center, tertiary and teaching hospital and a medical school in South London. At St. George uh, Hospital, he was the Royal College of Medicine um, site tutor and lead for the medical education department with 60 junior doctors in training. He now works as a consultant at Tawam Hospital in Elaine uh, in the United Arab Emirates, and he's one of the core faculty members for emergency medicine residency program. His main interests are medical education, trauma and resuscitation, and airway and sedation skills. Welcome, Dr. Mansour, and Mike is yours. Assalamualaikum. Good day to you all. My name is Mansoor Hussain. I'm a consultant in emergency medicine at Tawam Hospital in Al Ain. Um, I'd like to thank Ekrem for the uh, opportunity to deliver this talk and for the fantastic work that they've been doing as part of the uh, EBM Grand Round program. And uh, well done, guys. Carry on. Keep it up. You're doing really well, and we are all very, very proud of you. And it's an honor to be uh, invited to be part of the program. My talk is going to concentrate on how to conduct a literature review and how to write a research protocol. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest or any prior interests to declare. Uh, we'll move on and we'll just talk about the contents of the talk. So we're going to talk about what is a literature review, um, what is a literature search, what the difference is between them. And also we'll talk about uh, why would you do one, <coughs> excuse me, from my slightly harsh voice. I think I'm recovering from this bug that's been going around. Um, we talk about why we would do a literature search, what is the point of it, talking briefly about how you define a question which will help you conduct a search. Uh, then we'll move on to the databases and the sources, resources that are available for conducting a search. And we'll also talk about uh, any other resources or sources you should be looking at when you're looking, when you're conducting a search. And then finally, we will go on and just briefly conduct a search. I'll use an example of some of a topic that I'm interested in, uh, talk about some of the top tips. And then very briefly, we'll talk about how to write a research protocol or a, or a research proposal. Um, this is quite a complicated topic. It's something that, you know, you it varies from place to place. But we'll just talk about the brief things you need to cover when, when you are writing one. And, and just a kind of a, a brief methodology on how to go about it. So what is a literature search? A literature search is quick and dirty. It's a phrase we used to use all the time in the, in the UK. It's used everywhere. Uh, it's quick and dirty. It's something that you just basically Google something and you find an answer for a clinical question or a topic. You just look at the first few, uh, first few kind of um, uh, uh, topics that come up in Google. Or you can look at PubMed or look at uh, one or two other little databases. You just put in a couple of search terms and you just bring up some papers and some relevant information. It's great for informal learning. It's not really something you can just do uh, as literature search is something to, that begins your interest in a topic or kind of, you know, builds up some of the uh, knowledge base that you have about a topic. And it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's great for generating ideas for future topics. It's not something that you can really use for uh, writing a research proposal or for writing a paper. It will not give you all the evidence available for a topic. It will just help you when it comes down to learning a little bit more about a topic. Compare that to a literature review. Uh, literature review is much more detailed. Uh, you're going to be looking at multiple databases, multiple medical databases. You're going to be looking at trials registries, you're going to be looking at the grey literature, you're going to try and find as much uh, information about any unpublished data or trials that's going on, poster presentations from uh, various conferences, uh, and try and broaden your search and, and make it a little bit more in depth as well. You're going to use multiple search terms, you're going to try and narrow your literature uh, or your uh, information search down to something uh, which is a little bit more specific towards the topic that you want to be writing a paper about. And you should generally base your literature review around a question. You may not be able to answer that question. Um, 
you may not be writing a review article, you may not be writing, uh, you, may, you may just be trying to find a bit more information about a topic uh, to help you perform a study or help you plan a study or, a, or some, you know, to answer a clinical question, but you may not find the specific answer to that question. And then that will lead you on to the type of study you want to do and uh, allow you to maybe, you know, start some new research on a topic or publish some new research on a topic. It's primarily designed to provide context around a topic or a new piece of research and gives you a guide about what you already know about the topic. Compared to now a literature search versus a literature review versus a systematic review. Now a systematic review is much more detailed. It's designed to answer a specific question. You are trying to find an answer in a systematic review by going through all the available data out there and saying, yep, we have a definitive answer or we have a pretty decent answer on which you can hang your hat on. It uses a very robust search methodology, which quite a lot of it you should be doing when you are doing a literature review. But uh, that research or that search methodology needs to have very explicit methods, needs to be absolutely transparent in how you're doing it, and it needs to be reproducible. Someone else should be able to produce the same or obtain the same data or the same number of papers and come to the same conclusions that you do using the methods that you did. Uh, you can come up, you should, with a systematic review, have a consort diagram. Uh, I'll just show you an example on how you, um, how you came up with the data. So here we went through PubMed and there's a thousand paper studies identified. On Embase there were 661. And then you were looking at, in other sources and you found 11. You found a total of 1,700 studies. Remove the duplicates, 1,538 left. And then you excluded certain studies because of their study type or the population wasn't relevant or the intervention wasn't relevant. You broke it down to 512 abstracts. You screened them through and you removed a bunch of them because the study type wasn't what you were looking for or the intervention wasn't what you were looking for. You ended up covering 34 full text articles. And then as you screened the full text, you removed another 13, in this case, six were removed because they were only abstracts and you couldn't get the full text. And then in your qualitative analysis, you looked at 21 papers. So it's very open and transparent as to how you've done it. So now we move on to why do we do a literature review? It's primarily for locating information on a topic or identifying gaps in the literature for areas of future study. It's to help you come up with your study question and uh, so that you don't make you don't do a study that isn't uh, relevant or a study that has already been done. Uh, you want to build on information that's already out there. It's also helpful in kind of synthesizing a conclusion in an area where there is a little bit of ambiguity. If you have two treatments and you're not sure which one is more efficacious or which one has fewer side effects, uh, or you know what should be the appropriate course of action. So it can sometimes help you um, come up with an answer. And it's also there primarily to help clinicians and researchers inform their decision making and, and also make practice guidelines as well. So some of you will be involved in writing guidelines uh, or protocols for your departments. And it, it's a good way of, in, of providing evidence based medicine for those guidelines. Now, this is how I looked when I first started doing literature searches. I didn't have a clue uh, about what I was going to do or where I was going to start. But don't worry, we'll hopefully get you from here to a much more kind of satisfied uh, look at your face at the end of the day. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, you need to define the question. And there are many ways of defining a question. For clinical research, a good way of defining a question is using PICO, uh, which is look at the population you want to study. You look at an intervention that you want to perform on that population. You look at the comparator, you look at something else that's already out there, is one better than the other? What am I going to compare it to? Or is am I going to compare it to doing something versus not doing something? And then you want some outcomes. You want to look at what is the outcome of my study? What am I going to be measuring? Am I measuring side effects? Am I measuring uh, improvement? Am I measuring quality adjusted life years? Am I measuring uh, you know, major acute coronary events? There's a whole list of things, but you have to define your outcome. And then there's a T in brackets with PCOT and you have to look at a time frame. Do I want to look at 
the outcomes over a certain amount of time? Do I want to do this study over a, a week, a month, a year, five years, 10 years? So there is this uh, little brackets T there for defining your timeline as well. There are other ways of defining questions, primarily, I mean, other, question, other mnemonics you can use for health policy management research, which is something I did uh, many, many years ago as, as part of my uh, management and health, uh, healthcare management degree. Uh, we look, I mean, Eclipse is one way when you look at expectation, client group, location, impact, professionals and service. And this is primarily for health policy and management research, more of a macro level thing. There's a SPICE kind of mnemonic as well, which you look at uh, service evaluation, which is something you may want to look at when you're looking at doing a quality improvement pro uh, project. Uh, when you look at the setting, the perspective, the intervention, the comparison and the evaluation. We'll concentrate on PICO right now because we're primarily looking at uh, clinical research. So let's use an example. Let's make this real world kind of relevant. I have an interest in sedation and, and airway and kind of uh, in the overlap with the intensive care and anesthetic side of emergency medicine. Um, so we're just going to pick a topic that I like, I am interested in. So I'm interested in key to fall for sedation in the ED. But I want to know how does it compare to ketamine or propofol? These are both drugs that have been used for sedation. Ketamine much more commonly. It's slightly safer, I would say, in terms of monitoring, in terms of side effect profile. That's my opinion. Um, are we going to compare ketofol to those drugs? Well, yeah, I mean, that's ketofol is a mixture of ketamine and propofol. So it makes sense to compare them to either one of those drugs. And is it as safe as ketamine or propofol? And does it work as well? Are the doses, you know, the, are you sedated just as well with ketofol? Uh, do you need higher doses, lower doses? So this is the general topic that I want to look at. Now, from this, this kind of question that I have or this topic that I have, let's turn it into a PICO. So the population is adults and children or adults or children, you can define it as you want, undergoing procedural sedation, conscious sedation. I prefer the term procedural sedation, light sedation or moderate sedation. You know, they're all overlapping terms in the emergency department. So people undergoing procedural sedation in the ED. My intervention is ketofol which is a one-to-one -one in my, the way I like to use it, one-to-one -one propofol ketamine mix for procedural sedation. What's the comparator? Well, I'm going to compare it to ketamine or propofol for procedural sedation or ketamine and propofol for procedural sedation. And then what are my outcomes? Well, my outcome, as we mentioned earlier, the safety and equivalence or efficacy, and in that, the doses of drugs used. So PICO question there. Very easy to put it into a kind of a PICO table. And from that, you can bring out your keywords. And the keywords here are emergency department and procedural sedation. That's my population. If you wanted to do pediatrics or adults, you could add that in there. Um, then you want to look at what's your intervention? Well, ketofol. And what are my comparators? Well, my comparators are ketamine propofol and my outcome is safety and efficacy. There I have a bunch of keywords there, which we will use a little bit later in making our, uh, or in do, performing the search itself. So now you have a question. Um, the question, the next thing is, where do you search? Uh, and there's a bunch of places you can search. Um, but it, you know, you can't, Google is just one, but we have to, you know, we're, we're doctors, we're professionals, we're trying to use evidence-based medicine. So we have luckily a bunch of databases which we can look at. Medline. So Medline is, it's a 22 plus million. It's actually probably above 25 million now. This information is a little bit old. References from almost 6,000 journals worldwide. Uh, Medline is one of the main places to look. It has um, another little subsection, which is the Medline in process and other non-index citation database. This uh, basically looks at data that hasn't quite been published yet or data that is on, you know, in studies that are ongoing. Then you have Embase. Embase is another massive uh, resource uh, which has 30 plus million references from 8,500, now closer to 9,000 uh, journals, basically. Um, off note, there's a significant amount of journals that are not listed in Medline. Um, so Embase, uh, at least when I was in the UK, it was our first port of call for searches and Medline was kind of the second port of call. Uh, there are others as well, which we'll talk about briefly. Uh, PubMed, 
Now PubMed is great, it's free, it's accessible to everyone, and it gives you a free version of Medline. It may not, you may not be able to access a lot of the, the full texts, but it can give you an idea, and it, it is basically a free version of Medline. It acts, well, gives you access to a free version of Medline, and also provides access to a few other life sciences journals as well, uh, which change from time to time. But these are your three main kind of medical databases relevant to kind of clinical research for physicians, I would say. Um, <clears throat> there's a bunch of other uh, databases that you need to consider. CINAHL is a pretty big one. Uh, it's the basic cumulative index to nursing and allied health literature, primarily nursing and allied health literature, but don't discount it. There are, it's a very, very good database. There's some fantastic studies on there, um, some of which may be absolutely relevant to your topic or your question. There's also the AMED database, which is Allied and Complementary Medicine database. Now, depending on your topic and your question, this may also be relevant for you. And then we have PsycInfo, uh, which is primarily for psychological behavioral sciences. Um, again, may be useful if your topic is uh, to do with mental health, if your topic is to do with the uh, neuro, you know, medicines which affect the brain, medicines which or you know, therapies which affect behavior, social sciences. It is quite a good topic to, it's quite a good database to consider if your question is related to it. Can't forget the Cochrane Library. Uh, as of yesterday, day before yesterday, there were 8,776 reviews, Cochrane reviews on the Cochrane Library. Um, they also have a little subsection, which is the Cochrane Central Register of uh, Control Trials which is probably the most comprehensive resource of randomized controlled trials currently in, you know, in one place, which is searchable. All of this is available through the Cochrane uh, homepage, basically. And not all of the data on Embase uh, for these randomized, or at least specifically for the central side of Cochrane, not all of this is uh, readily available on Embase or on Medline. So do consider uh, looking up Cochrane and the Cochrane Library, because there may be stuff going on which is absolutely relevant to the topic you want to research. Now there are other places you can search. The question is, you know, well, there's a bunch of places you can search. Best Bets website, we love Best Bets from, from the UK. Uh, a lot of, we encourage a lot of our, we used to encourage a lot of our juniors to publish something on Best Bets. Um, certainly as for the question that I have formulated, there's a couple of relevant things on Best Bets. And then we're going to look at Google Scholar, uh, Google Scholar is also a subsection of Google, which I found it not to be significant, you know, massively useful. I find it kind of lays out a whole bunch of, uh, you know, basically stuff that Google does. It just gives you a list of links and a lot of those links. So in the topic that I searched, you know, we did with those 1100, you know, things for key to fault and 1100 web pages is way too much for me to look at. And actually the vast majority of them, or at least the first 50 that I read through, were all found on, on, on my uh, Medline search anyway. So, but consider Google Scholar. It, it's something to do to, to for completeness sake. The other thing to look at is to look at some specific trials registries. If you're looking at randomized controlled trials, um, there's a the clinicaltrials.gov website. There's the drugs at FDA uh, kind of website from the FDA from, for pharmacological research or pharmaceutical research. European Medicines Agency, which is similar. And then there's the WHO International Clinical Trials Registry Platform, which is another place to, to look at, to just see if there are any trials currently registered that are ongoing. Um, fair amount of these will be on the Cochrane side of things. Uh, so you can look at them on Cochrane, but also look at different trials registries. Now, just a little bit of a caveat when it comes to searching, and this is something which I found, uh, which, and this is something that will vary from person to person, place to place, and country to country, and organization to organization, unfortunately. So Embase, Medline, Sinal, a lot of these big medical databases requires a subscription. Um, and this subscription is not something that everyone uh, will have immediate access to. They're paid subscriptions, which your organizations tend to do it. Currently, disappointingly, I think, uh, SEHA doesn't have access to Embase. Uh, I have access to Medline, Sinal, and all of those things. Unfortunately, I used to have uh, an Athens password, NHS Athens password, which gave me access to all the NHS resources, but that has recently expired. 
So I'm at the moment limited to what SEHA will allow me to do as my employer and as the organization that I'm accessing all of this information through. Uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the uh, non-subscription stuff, is, of course, is free by definition. Cochrane, PubMed, Google, Twitter, all of this is free. Do consider Twitter. There's a lot of foam uh, ED stuff around, basically, uh, and you can always look at uh, topics or the topic that you're looking at. Look it up on Twitter. See, look at the people you're following when it comes to foam. Look at the podcasts and things. Uh, look at web blogs and things like this because you may find that they found an article which you haven't found because most of this stuff is based on evidence-based medicine or it should be anyone you're following and when it comes to foam should have an evidence base to it um, and they will link, generally link you to an article you may not be able to, you may not have found that article in your search so it's worth doing a kind of quick and dirty search of Twitter or quick and dirty search of uh, different blogs that you follow um, you may not be able to get the full article but there are ways around that, which is primarily try and contact the author. So you may find an article in any of your searches that you can't get the full text for. Uh, contact the author. They, they, you'll, if you, even if they don't have a direct kind of contact, uh, vis, you know, visible or available on, on wherever you found that, uh, wherever you found that uh, paper, you can Google them. You can figure out roughly what part of the world they're in what field of medicine they're in and Google them. And generally speaking, you'll be able to find through some searching an official work email for them. So please always try and contact an author when you are doing a, a systematic review or a very, very detailed literature review and you haven't got access to the full paper, definitely say, or definitely make some attempt of contacting the authors because they may be able to come back to you and say, well, actually our study is halfway done, but these are our findings so far. It's not something you can really cite, but it's something that it, it, it is a useful thing to do. Um, it's just kind of like an off the record kind of update as to what's going on with that paper. Now, without going into too much detail, I'm not a healthcare librarian. Uh, we're just going to talk very briefly about certain things you may have heard when it comes to doing a search. What's a mesh term? What's an expander? Simple EM answer to these things, or my my simple mind answer to these things is mesh term is very simple. It's a medical subject heading. This is what you are going to be using. A lot of medical databases use mesh terms. They use them slightly differently, some of them, but that is what you are typing in into your search field. You have explode or expand commands, which depending on your interface and how you're accessing a database and which database you're accessing, they vary a little bit. Uh, certainly my, the way I access databases here using the SEHA website is different to the way I used to access things uh, using the NHS portal for this. It also looks like the NHS portal for accessing all healthcare health services research is unfortunately going to go offline or be changing in a couple of months. Uh, and then access is going to be through individual organizations. There used to be an excellent portal for accessing all kinds of research through the NHS using one website, which would search all of the databases um, and would also combine searches from databases and give you an an and, and remove all the duplicate papers. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have something like that, or at least I don't have access to something like that. You might. Um, but bear in mind that the explode and expand command is a similar thing, but works slightly differently on different databases. Just a quick, uh, dirty search, as it were, of, of, of you know, one, one search term when I did Ketofol. And apologies, it's kind of printing backwards. But if you look here, when I just typed in Ketofol and I looked at all my search terms, I got, and this was using Medline Plus, basically, uh, on uh, using my SEHA access, I got 743 results for 743 papers that mentioned Ketofol. Now I used a couple of expanders here. I basically said, apply any related words to Ketofol, also search within the full text of the articles and apply equivalent subjects. And again, each different database and search uh, engine will use slightly different ways of applying equivalent subjects. Uh, for example, if you were to search for propofol, it may include uh, propofol. And then when you apply related words or, or equivalent subjects, it may say Lipuro, Diprivan, and any other you know generic sorry not generic any other proprietary name you have for propofol uh trade name you have for propofol if you type bisoprolol would it cover concor and all the other variants of it 
Um, Again, each database does things differently. But as you can see, when I applied some expanders to it from 743, we more than doubled it and it went up to 1644 results. Um, so do consider how you're going to use explode and expanded commands for your search. Boolean operators, these are wonderful things. If any of you have ever done any bit of computer programming, uh, you understand this, but it's very simple. We've all done basic maths. It's basically and, or, and not. Uh, and I'll, use, I'll show you a couple of examples of this on the, when we do the search itself, or when I did the search. So very simply, basically look at you know, this the kind of Venn diagram, essentially. You have depression and anxiety. So basically, when you search for depression and anxiety, you're going to get, this is depression, this is anxiety, but you're only going to get papers which state depression and anxiety. If you want to say or, it's basically everything in depression or everything in anxiety, so it does both of them. And then when you say depression, not anxiety, because there is an overlap area here, it's basically just going to say I want the papers which stay, have the word depression in them, but I don't want the papers which have anything to say with anxiety, even though that will take out some of the papers with depression. Looking here, again, apologies for the way it's printing out or, or it's coming out quite small. Um, on my first search term, we looked at Ketofol, 1644 expanded, and these are all using all the expanders. I'll, we'll talk about expanders a little bit later. Um, but when I did Ketofol and Propofol, uh, we brought it down a little bit. We had uh, 1565 when I did Ketofol and Ketamine. We had uh, 1496 papers or search results, let's say. Um, and then when I did ketamine, well, propofol, ketamine and propofol, 1468. However, when I asked for ketofol and ketamine, but not propofol, I don't want propofol, any papers which mention propofol, I got down to 15. Interestingly, when I did ket ketofol and propofol, but not ketamine, we were 96. It just kind of implies that there probably are a lot more papers which are mentioning ketofol and propofol uh, as opposed to papers which seem to be mentioning ketofol and ketamine. So it just gives you an idea if you want to do some research, maybe ketamine and uh, comparing ketamine and ketofol may be uh, an area where there's less published data. Now you're, you guys are looking like this, you're probably looking like I am now more confused than I ever was before. I don't understand Boolean operators don't understand expanders and exploded terms. I don't understand anything. Um, don't worry, we're now gonna try and get you to be a little bit happier at the end of this. So let's do a search. We've basically mentioned our population, our intervention, our comparators and our outcome. We've made a question. This was the table from earlier. We've got our search terms. This, just below this, is the interface that I have when I log in through Seha um, and I have tab which says Medline and EDS. I have an open access tab. I have PubMed and then a Pico search. Primarily you'll use the first and the third, first and the third tab. Um, there's an option there. I can, you can see I've kind of typed in ketamine, but I don't want to use just that. I want to go into the advanced search. And when you click advanced search, you come up with a page that looks like this. Again, apologies that it's all kind of projecting a bit small. Um, but at the top we have my first search term, Ketofol, and you're using your keywords basically, and in emergency department, and Propofol, and Ketamine. Now I ran this search in many ways, but I just want to use this as an example of my of, of how I narrowed down my my uh, my uh, kind of results to a, a manageable level. We ticked on Boolean or phrase searching, or you can click on Find all my search terms if you're using multiple words. Um, I've ticked, these are my expanders here. I've said, apply any related words. Unfortunately, it doesn't, I mean, you can look into very, into very detailed way. There is a, a way of looking at what algorithm it's using for related words, what algorithm it's using for equivalent subjects. Uh, we're trying to keep it simple right now. And I've also said, please search within the full text of the articles rather than just searching the abstracts. I'm not limiting my results. I'm not limiting my language. I'm not limiting anything here. All of these things you can do if you wanted to. By leaving the disciplines blank, I'm basically including all the disciplines there. Um, so this is just an unlimited search of uh, 
Medline using the four search terms above and including all of them together. And when you do this, you find I've got here 744 results, um, which is a lot. I don't know if you guys have the time to go through 744 kind of results and look through abstracts for 744 papers. You may do. If you're doing a systematic review, this may be the way you want to do it. It's difficult for one person to do, but again, it depends on your time frame, depends on how many people are working with you. Let's get rid of full text. Okay, let's just look at people who put these words in their in their uh, abstracts because at the end of, and and in the keyword section when the when the papers are being published, because ultimately these are the keywords that I'm looking for. If they've mentioned these words somewhere in their you know two thousand word kind of study, but they're not what the study is about. Let's let's remove them. If you remove them. I got to 44 results and all I've done and this is quite useful when you look at your search history it tells you what your search terms are it tells you what your options are at least this is how it's exported on, on the kind of the Seha web interface and all I've done is remove from this full text of the article and I've got oh 44 results and then you go maybe that's too few depending on what you want to do you know if, if if this is some if this is initial an initial phase of uh, research or, or, or literature search, you may find 44 is okay. But yeah, I would argue that that's possibly too few. Then what do you do? Well, the next thing I did was, let's get rid of emergency department, okay? Because maybe ketofol, ketamine, propofol, are used for sedation in outpatients. Maybe they're used for sedation in uh, the operating room maybe they're used for sedation in uh, the endoscopy suite the, or patients having a bronchoscopy or in ICU. There's a number of places it could be used and if I just limit and it, that and those papers may be relevant to the emergency department because they're still using the same medicines for sedation. So let's get rid of emergency department and let's say okay well why don't we just do procedural sedation, ketamine, propofol. And here, as you can see, as soon as we replace emergency department with procedural sedation, and bearing in mind we are applying related words and equivalent subjects, so it may well say procedural sedation, conscious sedation, mild, moderate sedation, all of those things will be included. We're now at 196 papers. And you go, well, okay, that's more manageable. 744 was probably too many, 44 was probably too few. 196, yeah, I could go through 196 uh, results over a few days, you know, over three, four days. And primarily I'm just reading through the abstracts and you don't have to read all the abstracts. You can immediately tell by the title of the paper if it's not relevant, but I could do that. So now you remember, so this is how you have to kind of change your, you know, modify your search strategy and decide, you know, how am I gonna get the best pickup, but also not waste my time. Just for interest, just out of interest, when I just typed in key to fall, in PubMed, I well, I used this was the search query that I did: ketofol and emergency medicine, emergency department and procedural sedation and ketamine and propofol. I came up with 30. So as you can say, that's probably a bit too few. So what I need to do is rerun this and change some of my Boolean operators here, maybe change some of my mesh terms to come up with something a little bit. But what I did find is of these 30, I didn't see anything that wasn't already in my Medline search, but it's worth doing. But we know that it's unlikely to have anything new on it, but if there is something new, it's worth looking at. Best bets, Ketofol, three papers. Now the first one, the one that's the closest link to what I was looking for, procedural sedation for uh, ketamine or Ketofol. Uh, basically uh, in adults in the emergency department, it's links to a paper it's actually a best bet based on a paper, on a critical uh, appraisal of a paper, and of a decent paper actually, but that paper is actually in, uh, that paper is visible in my searches through Medline. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's a pediatric side as well. Um, when I looked at the Cochrane database and I just typed in Ketofol, 
I found uh, a review on, this is a review articles basically on anesthetic and sedative agents used for electrical cardioversions. There you go, I missed that earlier, but actually uh, cardiologists may well be using these medicines as sedation for cardioversion, for, for elective uh, or emergency cardioversion. Um, and then also propofol for procedural sedation in emergency departments. This is also something uh, which is maybe relevant. It's a Cochrane Review article. If you're looking at sedation in the ED, I should you know, strongly suggest you read this article because it's, it'll probably be methodologi methodologically very sound and may give you some ideas as to your topic. So what do you do once you've done your, once you've found your search topic? What do you do next? Well, read the abstracts from your searches. You, um, with your friends, your research group, whatever, get, get, go through the abstracts from your searches and make a list of those articles that are relevant to you. Similar to the way the consort diagram was earlier when I showed you. Try and obtain the full articles from your database access. If you can't get it, speak to your librarian um, and they may be able to get you papers that you don't have direct access to. Summarize your findings. It's worth making a table uh, on Excel or Word or something like that and summarizing your findings. Go through the papers, do JEDAD scores and a bunch of things that you can do. Critically appraise them. Um, not necessarily in, you know, in as much detail as you're presenting a pa each paper on a at a journal club, but definitely appraise them and you know, if I look at their method method excuse me, methodological strengths, methodological weaknesses, it's worth doing uh, because then you know you're pulling on a good, you know, good core of data for your own research. Summarize your findings, as I've said. Um, now look at the findings and ask and help them kind of answer your research question or design your study. You need all of, you know, all of this is to help direct you, as we mentioned earlier, in, in doing your own research. Hopefully now things make sense. Hopefully you're happy, you're happy Ron Burgundy, everything's feeling happy. You, you've kind of gone from that to, hmm, I get it, fingers crossed. So some, just some top tips on uh, basically on doing a literature search or a literature review. Uh, they're in no particular order, but number one, get help. Okay, if you've not done this before and you're not very good at it and you're not doing it regularly, and I certainly don't do it that frequently, I would still get help. Okay, ask for help. Who do you ask for? You can ask your healthcare librarian. That's your number one person you want to ask. Uh, healthcare librarians are interesting beings. Um, they have a phenomenal amount of information about this uh, and how to run a, a proper search, method, methodologically sound search, and they will no understand mesh terms and expanders, Boolean operators. They will know how to get the most out of each search engine and each database. Also, when I should have written here, apart from your healthcare librarian, ask your research guru. Every department has one or two or three people who are massively interested into research, people who have published thousands of papers before. Uh, speak to them. They're probably just as useful as a healthcare librarian when it comes to doing a search. Take your time. Sit down, think about what you want to do. Define your question properly and think about it. Don't have to do this in five minutes or a day. It will take you several days to get it right. Remember to search more than one database. There are a bunch of databases. We mentioned some of them earlier. Go through more than one of them. If you, if you have just access to Medline, see if you can get access to Embase. Uh, if you just have Embase, see if you can get access to Medline. Always back it up with a PubMed search. Even though PubMed is overlapping a lot of the Medline stuff, try and do that. Look at Senal. I would advise you to look at Senal. Look at Cochrane. Look at Google. Okay. Use expanded and exploded terms, Boolean operators. We've mentioned that earlier. If you are confused about these things, speak to your healthcare librarian. Try not to have too many results or too few results. If you end up with, uh, if you end up with a thousand results and you think you've done a good search, you probably haven't done a good search. If you end up with 10 results, again, you probably have not done a good search. There's something methodologically wrong with what you've done. Try and look at unpublished or grey literature. Look at, you know, I would back up your search with uh, a Google Scholar search. I would try and look at it. I, I would look at the databases that are around, uh, the trials databases that are around, look at different places. Try and look at minutes of uh, 
meetings that may be relevant, try and look at poster presentations that have been presented uh, in your region or nationally or internationally at various conferences, go through a few conferences, uh, you know, a, a, a few kind of, uh, go through the conference kind of schedules and see if there's anything there because you may be able to get in touch with the author off that poster which covered a lot of the stuff that you were looking at even though that poster was not published anything you know beyond just being uh, shown at a conference it's always worth getting a friend to do the search as well so get one of your mates sit down and just say listen this is what i'm looking at you don't have to tell them the same search terms you were doing because you, you don't want to you know you don't want to get it you know uh, introduce any bias into their search but you could definitely get them to run a similar search and see if they come up with a similar number of papers because everyone will do their own search a little bit differently try and contact the authors i've said that i cannot understate that enough if you can't get hold of a full published paper definitely try and contact the author and if you get hold of a fully published paper and you have some questions or you find it it is exactly the topic that you want to talk about speak you know contact the author and just have a chat to them everyone is publishing research everyone who is publishing research will be happy to be in touch with someone else who is trying to do similar research that's why we're publishing this is all out in public forum i would say it's all out in the medical forum and we are all there to help uh, improve patient care ultimately and then finally again get help all right get help again First tip, last tip, speak to someone and help them and get them to help you do your search. So hopefully that's everything about literature searches. We're now going to move on and talk very briefly about writing a research protocol. Now this in itself is a huge topic. This could be a four hour talk, which I'm probably not qualified to give, but they, you know, these are this in itself is a huge, huge side topic. So we'll just talk briefly about writing a research protocol or research proposal. Protocol implies a little bit more detail. So once you've come up with an idea for a research topic, you've done your search, you've kind of looked into it, you've refined your idea a little bit, what do you have to do? Well, you've got to try and turn it into a research project. So a research protocol is there to design to help you kind of present, think through your proposed project. It, it, it's there to help you go through what you're doing and, and, and give you a plan on how to do it. Big point here, um, templates and protocol for writing a research kind of proposal, it varies from country to country, institution to institution, region to region. It, most organizations will have templates or guidelines on how to do it. You may have certain boxes you need to jump through in one country that you don't in another or in one region or another, one organization or another. It very much varies. So check your own organization's guidelines because they will be up to date for, for the kind of the, the legal side, from the ethical side, it'll cover everything for your particular uh, institution. Uh, get expert advice. Again, speak to people who, there are people who have written hundreds of research protocols, speak to them. Get your research guru involved, get your supervisor involved. And the final point is make sure you're up to date with GCP. I'm not going to go too much into GCP. GCP is a course, good clinical practice. It's something you need to do if you're involved in research. There are a bunch of online ways of doing it. Uh, get in touch with your supervisor or the ECRIM uh, kind of founders because they know how to do it. Certainly Unzil helped me get mine up to date here after I'd, my one from the UK had expired. Now, what do you need to include in your research pro uh, proposal or protocol? Talk about the background. You need to say why. Why do you want to research a topic? You're trying to get. You're trying to explain to someone else in your organisation why you want to do a bit of research. So, what's the clinical significance of it? I'll try and use some examples from the propofol, ketamine, ketofol thing. But you know, just what's the clinical significance? You look at available statistics. You look at is it relevant to the ED? Is it relevant to the population? So for this, you could turn around and say, well, actually, X, X percentage of people who attend the ED need procedural sedation. So that immediately is a reasonable amount of people that, and it's relevant because we are doing sedation on a bunch of people. You want to look at what else is going on. Are we missing stuff? You know, uh, there are a bunch of people who get ketamine or propofol or ketofol. People who get ketamine get complications. So we've all seen it, emergence phenomenon primarily. 
hypersalivation and, and those kind of, uh, well, hypersalivation and um, laryngospasm, very rare. For me, the biggest complication I tend to see is nausea, nausea vomiting. People tend to vomit. Certainly children tend to vomit. Every child who comes into the ED seems to be eating a packet of crisps, sorry, chips, uh, even though they need sedation and then you have to wait for a while. But invariably, these kids always end up vomiting after you give them ketamine. So there are complications out there. You look at, you go through some data on you in your department or in the literature and say, well, this is the complication rate for this. So you can basically build up a background and, and try and get the person who you're making the proposal to interested and say, oh, actually, it is relevant to us. So basically, it's why is this topic so important to study? You formulate your clinical question based on your PICO question. Is ketofol as safe as ketamine for sedation in the ED? So how are you going to answer, you know, how is this, when you answer this question, what's it going to do? Is it going to inform medical science? Is it going to improve medical education? Is it going to improve treatment for a condition? Well, yeah, in this case, hopefully we'll allow for another safer drug for sedation. Maybe ketofol is better than ketamine. Maybe it's safer. Maybe it has a better side effect profile. That's what I want to find out. Now you have to have a study hypothesis and your null hypothesis is always, there's no difference between. So then you say there's no difference between ketofol and ketamine sedation in ED safety outcomes. That's primarily what you want to look at. Or you could say there's no difference in efficacy between the two things. So you have a hypothesis. You have to mention this in your research protocol. Then you look at your primary outcome. Well, I'm going to look at in safety outcomes, I'm going to look at rates of complications. That's what my primary outcome is going to be. How you measure it is something you have to define. Aims are kind of your, a little bit more like your secondary outcome measures. If you have two to three, four, don't try and make your research topic so broad that you're going to spend out, you know, spend weeks and weeks and weeks trying to answer it. And methodologically, it's very difficult to try and do a study which has got too many outcomes. You say, well, each aim will basically state how you will test your hypothesis and answer your study question. So I'm going to measure rates of complication in ketamine and ketofol sedation in the ED. And then you look at the percentage of patients look, needing second doses. That's looking at your efficacy side or, or equivalence in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of dosing. Then you have to talk about your methodology. I, I'm not going to cover methodology here because it's going to be covered later on in this, in, in the, you know, in in the kind of evidence-based grand rounds program. Let's talk about study design. You have so many different types of study, but you could just, for example, do a retrospective survey on the sedations performed in your emergency department and look at ketamine, keto, uh, propofol, ketofol use and extrapolate your data from there. Or you can turn around and say, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do a randomized control trial on patients, you know, a prospective double-blinded randomized control trial on patients needing sedation in the ED. They're gonna come in, we're gonna randomize them to ketofol arm or propofol arm. It's gonna be difficult to do a blinded randomization for ketamine because ketamine is a clear liquid, but ketofol and propofol tend to look the same in a syringe if they're mixed properly. Uh, so you could do it that way. And, or you could, you know, there's, when you're going into an RCT, there's a whole bunch of additional things you need to consider, but you could do a prospective RCT on this. It may take you a long time to get the data you want, if, you know, but you have to look at it. In your methodology, you have to mention who your participants are, define your study population. Who are you going to include in this study? Who are you not going to include in this study? Who are your subjects, basically? Adults, pediatrics, both, whatever. You need to do a power calculation. You need to look at the number of people you're going to study. You're going to need to look at the different people with different arms of the trial. If you have different arms, you, you base all of this is based on statistical calculation or on power calculations. So get help from a statistical guru. Look at your recruitment plan. How, when, where, who, how am I, how are we going to recruit people to this trial? So all of this information is absolutely relevant and you need to mention it in your research proposal. Other things you need to look at. Is there an intervention? Are we going to be looking at patients split into two arms, ketofol and ketamine? Or an observational study that there is no intervention in an observational study. So there may not be an intervention there. You need to, you need to state all of this and it depends on the type of uh, study you're going to be doing. Is it a, a comparison study? Is there a control arm? Is, there, is it a case control study? You know, there's a bunch of things. You, all of these things need to be mentioned in your methodology. You have to mention what your outcome measures are, which we spoke about earlier. So here we said we'll look at adverse effects during and after sedation. 
and then the dose in milligrams per kilogram and if a second dose was needed. Simple, keep your outcome measures simple. You can do further analysis for secondary tertiary outcome measures. It's not something you need to mention in your initial thing because you may find an interesting bit of information comes up during the study, but it's not something you accounted for in your protocol. Keep your study protocol or you know, simple, essentially. Talk about how you're going to perform data collection. Who's going to do it? Is it going to be online? Is there going to be a form to fill in? Where is this data going to be kept? Who's going to have access to the data? All of this stuff is important when you're writing a study proposal. Again, how is, the anal how is it going to be done? We've just mentioned briefly about how the data will be collected and managed. Uh, so in my case, let's do an online form. Um, how is the data going to be analyzed? Who's going to enter the data? Where? How is it going to be analyzed? Is it qualitative data? Is it quantitative data? Is it both? You know, um, did they vomit? Yes or no. Quantitative. Did they feel sick? Hmm. A bit more qualitative that, isn't it? So you have to look at these things. Um, when it comes to statistical tests you'll perform, what's, what package you're going to use, SPSS or what other type of data analysis package you're going to use, you need to mention this in your study protocol. And then you have to talk about how you're going to present the data. Is it going to, what, what you're going to have tables, what kind of tables you're going to do, you're going to have graphs, you're going to have charts, a brief idea of how you're going to present your data once you've analyzed it. You need to talk about the limitations of your protocol, what you're not going to study. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this specific question, but I'm not going to look at this and why. You need to be aware of these things when you're designing a, a, a research study. You have to look at any potential clinical issues, treatment issues, data collection issues, confidentiality issues, all of these things need to be mentioned when you do your study protocol, when you talk about how you're going to, you know, what the limitations are in your study. You need to be aware of these things, you need to have thought about these things, and the people you're submitting this data to who are going to say, yep, go ahead with your study, are going to want to know that you're aware of these things. How would you manage any untoward issues? There's a complication, there's a side effect, something happens. What will we do if something goes wrong? You need to anticipate these things. Last couple of bits, we're gonna talk a little bit about ethics and funding. Um, funding primarily, I mean, essentially what funding is needed? Is it gonna cost money? Most things cost money. If it's gonna cost money, then who's gonna pay for it? That's what everyone wants to know. That's what the bean counters and the managers want to know. They wanna know, who is paying for it? Where's the money coming from? Do you have sponsorship? Do you have someone with a research grant? Do you have, you know, they're gonna to wanna to know where it's coming from and how much it's gonna cost them. How are you gonna get this funding? You know, are there any conflicts of interest when it comes to getting this funding? Does the person, you know, person one of the, who you're gonna get the funding from actually work for a company that makes propofol? You know, that may be a conflict of interest. You need to declare these things during your study protocol or your, or your study, uh, when you're planning a study, essentially. Um, ethics, you need to get ethics approval. Uh, easy way is to go through and put all of this information into a very, very detailed ethics form, which every organization has. One of the things they would want to know is the participants in the study, are they, are you getting informed consent from them? Well, yeah, you need to. That's kind of an ethic. That's forget the trial, forget medical research. This is our kind of moral duty as physicians to get informed consent from our patients for everything we do. Um, are we going to give them an information leaflet? All of these things help when it comes to getting ethics approval. Then you need to get approved from your ethics committee. This is a separate form to your research proposal but you will need to go through this. And if you've got ethics committee approval, generally speaking, you've covered all the bases. Finally, you need to talk about time scale and dissemination in your research, pro uh, in your research plan or your research protocol. You need to have a realistic and achievable time frame. You need to plan and say, well, I'm going to do this randomized control trial and we're going to recruit 5,000 patients and do it on one site and do it in a month. No, you're not, it's not going to happen. Or you can turn around and say, well, actually, I need 500 patients and we're going to do it across 10 sites, but we'll give it 10 years. Well, that's not relevant either. The, you know, 10 years is way too long, maybe. You know, it depends on what you're doing. So you need to look at what the time frame is going to be. Have a plan. By the end of this time, we should be doing this. By the end of this time, we should have done this. We should have recruited X amount of patients by then and move on and do it. And bearing in mind, there may be dropouts in terms of your patients as well. So just have a realistic time frame. You may not be able to keep to it, but try and plan properly. 
you have to decide how the data will be disseminated. What are you going to do with this data now? You've collected it, you've, you've analyzed it, you've got some results, you've written a conclusion, you've, you've got pretty much everything ready to publish it. Well, where are you going to publish it? Is it going to be a poster? Is it going to be published somewhere in a, a recognized journal? You obviously, we all want to get stuff published in journals with high impact factors, but it's very difficult you know, you may not be able to aim for the journal like Nature. You may not be able to publish it there. You may be able to go for BMJ, EMJ, you know, a bunch of the American journals of emergency medicine, things like that. You may be able to do that, or you may aim for a smaller journal. But you have to have an idea as to where you're going to be aiming for publication. Again, speak to your supervisors, speak to your research guru. All of, they will have prior experience on where you can publish these things. And yeah, as I mentioned, have an idea of where you're going to be submitting data to, or your your uh, your completed kind of study to. Once you have a final draft, you know, make sure you always, you know, in, once you have it, when you're trying to write your final draft, make sure you're kind of checking in regularly with your supervisor. They'll have a lot of input as to your research protocol and your uh, and your research kind of plan. And before you submit it, make sure your supervisors had a look at it. Use your research guru. As you mentioned, there's always someone in the department who has done much more research than other people who have a lot of interest in this. They may not be necessarily in your department. They may be in the university attached to your hospital. They may be uh, someone you've worked with before. They may be an old mentor. They may be someone you know. Try and get people involved. People who are in this kind of hallowed position of being a research guru, they're often incredibly helpful. Very busy, difficult to get time with, but often incredibly helpful and will definitely go out of their way to kind of help direct you when it comes to you starting off in your kind of you know starting off on your journey in medical research and make sure you get help at all stages i can't overstate this get help and the other thing is follow your organizational guidelines most big organizations will have excellent guidelines on how to write a research protocol or write a research proposal um, and if you follow those, at least you'll be able in this kind of position where you will be able to try and hopefully get that approval through in your own organization. So that's a good step towards getting everything ready for publication. Finally, this is just a little, uh, just a template which I picked up from EMJ, which just shows what you need to do for a research protocol or proposal. And as we mentioned, you kind of have a research question, simple statement, the significance of the study using data, ideally, or using prior data that you've collected, come up with a hypothesis and the setting where you're going to be doing it. Talk about the methodological side of things, talk about the, the type, study type, inclusion, exclusion criteria, how you're going to measure variables, what you're going to do, what procedures they're going to be, how you're going to anticipate difficulties. <coughs> Excuse me. And then look at sample size, <coughs> ethical issues, funding issues, pilot data, time scale. All of this thing is here. Uh, this is just one template. There's multiple templates available online. Try and get one from your organization. It will certainly help speeding up uh, getting a research protocol through if you're using the template that your organization wants. Finally, just a few references. I believe these slides will be available to you. It's a very good article on how to carry out a, a systematic review uh, by Cambridge University Press. Then a, a small podcast, essentially a small pod, you know, a, a small webcast article, essentially on how to do a literature search. Just a few links for some of the databases, um, which you can Google and find the, the links anyway. But these are some that might be quite useful for you. Uh, the Cochrane Library, which is awesome, and Google Scholar, in case you didn't know how to get there. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Hopefully it was helpful. I appreciate it was a lot of information on two pretty big topics and we've kind of, we've, we've had to uh, simplify them a little bit here. Um, I hope it's been useful and helpful for you. Um, and uh, what I didn't put is my email address there. Uh, it's mhussain at seha.ae, m-h-u-s-a-i-n at seha.ae. Uh, all the ECRIM uh, team know my email address and how to contact me as well. I'm happy for you to have my phone number if you need it. Uh, please uh, feel free to get in touch. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to talk to you about these topics. And uh, inshallah, we will catch up again soon.
Thank you so much, Dr. Mansour, for this informative lecture. Um, we really learned a lot about how to conduct uh, a research protocol, how to search the engine, um, how to actually do it step by step, um, and what are the most important databases and resources to look into. I really like the examples uh, also that you showed. Um, they were really helpful and beneficial for us. So now that we're done with our um, lectures that we um, finished, so we can move now to our live Q&A uh, segment. So Dr. Mansour and Dr. Andrew, you can try to unmute yourself and you can open the camera if you like to be able to access uh, uh, the session and be able to answer uh, the questions and answers. And everyone, please feel free to type in your uh, question into the chat box. Uh, or any comments you have, and um, Tasneem and I will read them out loud to the speakers. So, so our first question is going to be for Dr. Andrew. Um, Dr. Andrew, uh, you can hear me, right? I can, yes. Good, good. All right, so um, in the lecture, you mentioned uh, that prospective uh, studies tend to confer um, a higher strength or purity to the outcomes obtained uh, through research, though this advantage uh, of prospective over retrospective uh, design has been used by mentors to discourage uh, retrospective uh, proposals altogether, exciting appropriate inadequacy um, to the clinical question in times at times. Uh, but at other times, just using uh, the retrospective design's general inferiority um, as a reason not to pursue it. So um, in your opinion, or what's in your point of view, uh, an appropriate uh, reboot to those who consider uh, retrospective research altogether unworthy of doing? Um, I certainly wouldn't call it unworthy. I've published lots of retrospective studies myself. And now with uh, computerized EMRs, they're easier than ever to do. So in fact, I would highly encourage them. Um, certainly for residents and junior faculty, they're ideal for, uh, for starting off your research career. It, it's just a matter of understanding what the the biases uh, and the limitations are of these studies. With a pro uh, prospective study, you're controlling how the data is collected. So you have control over the quality of the data collection. With a retrospective study, the data has already been collected. You don't have any control over that. So uh, that doesn't mean that you can't do a good retrospective study. And in fact, one way to get around the quality issue is to conduct a study in which you're collecting objective data only, not subjective data. And when I say objective data, so to give you an example, uh, one of the retrospective studies we did a few years ago, um, there was the hypothesis was that Patients presenting to the emergency department with non-specific complaints uh, were sicker than patients of the same age group uh, with specific complaints. And when I say non-specific complaints, I mean coming in saying things like, I just feel weak, I feel dizzy, I feel unwell. But there was, there was nothing specific about it at all, right? It didn't indicate any particular system, body system, as opposed to patients who come in and say, I've, I've got a chest pain or I can't move my right arm anymore, very specific complaints. So uh, what we did was we went into the triage database and we created a cohort uh, of all the patients over age 70 who presented with non-specific complaints. And then we looked at uh, patients, similar patients, so patients in the same age group during the same time period with specific complaints. And we compared in-hospital mortality rate, which is, as you'll agree, very a very objective outcome. Um, we looked at uh, duration of hospital stay, 
and ICU admission rate as well as ICU length of stay. So here's a situation where we're not relying on any subjective data. The data is very objective. Um, and so good quality control in terms of the data collection. And, uh, uh, and this can be done relatively quickly because everything can be done by computer. So if, you're, if you have access to, to the database, this could be done within a matter of hours. And we are able to, to compare the two groups, the two cohorts. So the non-specific complaint cohort to the specific complaint cohort, take a look at the outcomes. Is there any difference in the outcome? So our hypothesis suggested that the non-specific complaint cohort should have worse outcomes. Well, actually we found no difference at all. So we ended up concluding that people who present with non-specific complaints aren't necessarily sicker, they just aren't able to express their their medical issues as clearly, right? So that's, that's an example of how you can still do a good retrospective study as opposed to doing a prospective. So I'm a big fan of retrospective studies. And remember, you know, the, the, um, the initial study that showed a really strong association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer uh, was a case control study, a retrospective study, right? So that was the, the first study to show this strong association. So these are still important studies and they can be done well. And I highly encourage residents and junior faculty to perform these studies before attempting something more complex. Thank you, Prof. Andrew, for the explanation. I'm a big fan of retrospective studies as well, especially for junior researchers. So um, our next question is for Dr. Mansour. And uh, Dr. Mansour, based on your lecture, we can say that in a nutshell, the uh, literature review is a stepwise overview of previously published work on a certain topic. And it starts with uh, defining a question, searching for resources, then evaluating the list of the resources, and finally recapping the information into a written context. And I must say, Dr. Mansour, that was a brilliant demonstration of how to search uh, for resources. But out of these four steps, um, the evaluation step might still be a bit vague, especially for junior researchers. And Besides the fact that it's absolutely impossible to read all and cite all um, and every single publication within the scope of the proposed um, research uh, question, it also might be um, that some publications are actually questionable in terms of credibility and reliability, and it might be better if it's filtered out of the list of the references. So the question is here, Dr. Mansour. Can you suggest a strategy or perhaps a set of questions to follow in order to assess the quality of the selected resources? Thanks, Tasneem. <coughs> Excuse me, I always seem to have a little croaky voice whenever I'm giving lectures on Zoom. Uh, thank you uh, for your question. I think it's, it's an important thing you need to look at. It's difficult when it comes down to, uh, you know, saying which, you know, what research you should count in in your literature review and what you should not you know what you should discount I think you should have a reasonably open mind about it if it's coming up in your search then there's definitely going to be search terms in there which are relevant to you um, and there's going to be some information there that may be relevant to you I think it's difficult when it comes you know evaluation is kind of a continuum from critical appraisal as far as I'm concerned you need to have some basic appraisal skills um, have been going to journal clubs, have been doing, you know, looking at how to evaluate different types of papers before you can turn around and, you know, look at a literature search and evaluate every paper there. Now, obviously, as I mentioned in my talk, you're not, you may not want to do a one hour presentation on every paper and, and do it as a literature, you know, like you would present in a journal club. Um, so I think there's a few basic, there's a, mnemon, a couple of mnemonics you can use to look at the literature that you're getting or the searches that you're getting. Um, whether you're going to cover things, whether they're relevant to you, whether they are in the right, you know, whether 
they're written from the right perspective, whether they have, uh, in terms of time frame, they're not 15, 20, 30 years old. Some, sometimes, you know, we should be looking at medical research, ideally five years old, maximum, 10 years old, maximum. I think um, Prof. Andrew may, you know, he's obviously a research guru and I'm sure he has, uh, he can add something to it. But my personal, you know, there's a mnemonic you can use, a radar mnemonic is pretty good. You look at the research topic, is it relevant to you? Uh, is it a reliable source? Is it a journal with a high impact factor? Is, has it been cited multiple times? Has that article been cited uh, multiple times? Have the authors, are, are they known uh, researchers in that particular topic? Um, does it come from a, you know, as when you say reputable site, it's difficult to say, but if you're getting it in your PubMed or, well, sorry, your Medline or your Embase search, it's probably reputable enough to have been published in a medical journal. You have to look at, you know, authority, that's the next bit of the kind of radar mnemonic, decide is, uh, how has it been written, who's it been written by, um, is it, has it been written to kind of prove a point, um, and again, this comes under the appraisal side of the paper. You, you do have to appraise it to a certain extent. The D for radar is date. Is the date relevant? Is the, was the research published five years ago? Was it published 50 years ago? Um, is it ongoing research? Is it relevant that way? You have to look at, again, I mean, then there's a, the next two are a little bit more subjective when you look at appearance. In, just in this mnemonic, I mean, appearance and reason on the radar mnemonic. I mean, appearance, would you'd be talking about is it is the information presented does it make sense is is it well written does it match up with other data that you're getting if you're getting one paper which completely contradicts what all your other data you know, whatever all the other data in your literature review is coming up with then you have to kind of question that paper really but that comes into the appraisal side of things um, and then when it comes to you know where why was this data published in terms of reason is it being published to prove a point? Is it being published by someone who has a conflict of interest? Again, these are difficult things to do without actually reading the paper and without actually just doing some form of uh, analysis and appraisal on it. So I think that's the main thing is and it's, it's difficult to say whether you can actually, uh, you know, whether you can say it's credible or reliable, but without actually doing an element of critical appraisal on the paper itself. I think the main thing is get get practicing on critical appraisal, start doing journal clubs, start reading papers. There's many, many different ways of how, you know, many different tools you can use on how to appraise a paper. And, and you know, this isn't the forum to go into that detail, the discussion, but start practicing appraisal, get quick at it, get good at it, look at what the, you know, the things you want to look at and apply them to the papers you're looking at. That's probably the easiest way to, to decide, is this information accurate? Is it reliable? Is it relevant to what I'm doing? Great, a helpful mnemonic indeed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Masur, for your answer. Um, the third question is for Dr. Andrew. So um, many times researchers do what is known as a descriptive study, um, which is basically by collecting um, observational data uh, with many variables uh, to perform a sort of characteristics of like an X, uh, like for example, describing the patterns of disease uh, occurrence in relation to variables such as person, place, and time. Um, so in your opinion, like what are some advantages or even pitfalls um, of using this sort of study design? So with, with any research that, uh, research idea that we come up with. Uh, personally, I ask myself, what is the so what factor, right? Why will people care about this? Why will editors want to publish this? Or will they want to publish this? So there has to be clinical relevance there. We can't just <clears throat> go around measuring things for the sake of measuring them. Um, that really adds nothing to, to our knowledge. There's a, a famous quote that's, that's uh, often misattributed to Albert Einstein, but it goes like this. Not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So we need to think about why we're doing the measurement and will that have any impact? 
I mean, are we trying to lay a foundation uh, for further research? Are we looking at some sort of association? So the, the, the why you're doing it is probably the most important thing there. Um, in doing descriptive studies, there, there are often questions that, that one can fit into that uh, to look for an association. You know, doing, doing some sort of measurement just to show, uh, so we're talking about say an ecologic study or a, um, uh, a survey. So just reporting the, the description of what's going on is, is not terribly helpful unless you can get a really, really big picture. A lot of people will take a look at what's happening in their local hospital or in their local community. And there's not a great deal of external validity to that. So you may have a hard time publishing that. On the other hand, if you have access to a database and can look at what is happening, say, uh, nationwide, <clears throat> that makes a huge difference. Then it becomes much more, more relevant. So I, I don't know if I've answered your, your question clearly. Yeah, very much clear, Dr. Andrew. So thank you so much. And we have one more question to Dr. Mansour. And Dr. Mansour, you have some excellent methods for conducting search queries displayed and mentioned in your mm -hmm. lecture. And most of these, especially the Boolean operators, um, are what is used by researchers conducting literature research. Um, however, sometimes it can be difficult to navigate the same when conducting um, search uh, targeting specific uh, geographic region like the Middle East or North Africa. Um, now, perhaps there's a simple solution, but it again tends to cause some issues and confusion for most juniors uh, researchers. So the question is, um, are there any ways to maybe make this easier through search engines you mentioned? I think it depends on your interface with your search engine. Um, the example that I gave and the search engine interface that we're using through SEHA at least, uh, doesn't give you an option to search via directly via um, region or by country where the paper is published or where the research is done. And I think, um, I know the main point is the research can be done in a country and the, the, the journal will be based on a different one. It's, it's very rare. Or it's not often that you will be publishing in a journal, certainly not, you know, based out of UAE. We don't have a huge amount of journals that you know relevant to emergency medicine that may be publishing data for us. So. Uh, it's quite difficult and using the database that or the example and the screen that I used, it's very difficult to put a region in there unless you add it into your search terms. And I think the problem we have and finding region specific data is we are a small region uh, with a, a reasonably young uh, um, kind of research background or research kind of uh, history in terms of uh, publishing papers. Um, and if you want to limit, so depending on the topic, again, if you're going to be limiting it to the MENA region or United Arab Emirates or to the Gulf countries, you're significant, you know, you're going to cut out a huge amount of very relevant data. Now, again, and bearing in mind, we're quite a broad demographic base, kind of uh, ethnically, genetically. Um, I don't think we should really be kind of, you know, for example, just comment, you know, limiting our searches to just our region or the region we're in. Uh, interestingly, I basically thought, well, let's see how much has been published about Ketofol recently. I did a quick and dirty search, Ketofol and UAE, and there's one paper uh, coming through just by putting those two terms in. There's only one paper coming out, and that's from, I think, 2015, which was done uh, in SKMC. Um, and then when I did, uh, when I, there's, MENA doesn't seem to register on at least the search in, uh, send engine that I was using, but if you did Middle East, then there's one more paper coming in and that's from uh, an anesthesiology journal, which is based in our region and it talks about sedation using Ketofol there. So that may be relevant in terms of regional, but then you're limiting yourself to two papers, one from UAE, which was an SKMC case series, which was, uh, I believe, published as a poster. And then there's another one which is basically based in an anesthesiology journal, 
uh, and that's it. So I think you have to be very, very careful. There are other ways of searching for location data depending on your interface. The, the short version is go speak to your librarian. Also speak to your, um, your uh, mentor or your uh, tutor group lead or your research guru in your department and ask them, should we be limiting by a region or shouldn't, you know, is it relevant to limit by a region? And I don't think in this day and age, uh, limiting by region should really be that important unless you've got a very specific question. Certainly more useful if you're talking about health services data rather than clinical data, I think uh, you may want to limit by region or by demographic, but short version is ask, ask someone senior and more experienced. And secondly, if you want to get into the technicalities of it, speak to your librarian. Totally agree. Perhaps you you want to expand rather than limit your um, search, um, unless maybe like you want to search for like um, very specific uh, topics. So thank you so much, Dr. Mansour. This was helpful. And um, our dear audience, if uh, there's no further questions, I don't see any questions typed in the chat box. Um, I would like to announce the end of today's session and thank our both speakers, uh, Prof. Andrew and Dr. Mansour for a successful second module. And um, audience, don't forget to hit the link in the chat box to provide your feedback to the speakers in order to receive your CME certificates. Thank you all. See you next module. Um, Thanks, on behalf of Thanks, the entire team. team, thank you so much, Dr. Mansour, Dr. Andrew, for everything. Um, we really thank you. you for your time and cooperation and invaluable uh, contribution to this academic initiative. Um, I would also have, uh, I would want to thank each and every one of you uh, for attending this uh, from the audience and for your participation. And thank you, Neda, our host, uh, for your working, uh, for working your beautiful magic behind the scenes. Um, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward for the next future Ekram sessions, hopefully. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew and Dr. Mansour. Okay, well, congratulations on, uh, on doing such a great job in organizing this. Thank you. Thank you so much.